Hey everybody, you're listening to Life Below the Surface, presented by Carriage Kia. The podcast where we take you on a deeper dive into the lives of the animals at Georgia Aquarium and the people who care for them. Coming up on this episode... That meant um, anesthetizing a whale shark, which had never been done before. Um, and so I was uh, charged with working with some of our life support staff on um, inventing a machine that could anesthetize a whale shark. Well, I could tell you firsthand when you guys had implemented that shipwreck exhibit in the Ocean Voyager, that was cool. There's a parade through the streets with people with in giant inflatable whale sharks and people wearing you know, whale shark costumes and things. It's, it's a hoot to see that stuff happen. I'm Josh Blaylock. For the past 20 years, I've been in the zoological community. I was an animal care specialist for 15 of those years, caring for sea lions, dolphins, otters, walruses, birds, and a wide variety of different species. And now I'm very happy to be the senior manager of exhibits and projects here at Georgia Aquarium. In this podcast, I'm going to introduce you to some of my amazing co-workers and tell you some behind-the-scenes stories of how Georgia Aquarium works. This is Life Below the Surface, presented by Carriage Kia. Life Below the Surface is presented by Carriage Kia in Woodstock. Carriage is Georgia's leading Kia dealer and one of the top dealers in the entire nation. Service, community, and education are hallmarks of Carriage Kia in Woodstock. When it's time for you to lease or purchase your new vehicle, we hope you'll consider Carriage Kia in Woodstock. Check them out 24-7 at carriagekiawoodstock.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode one. Unbelievable. Episode one of Life Below the Surface. I'm Josh Blaylock, and I'm so happy you guys are joining us today because we're celebrating International Whale Shark Day. And we're going to talk about these elusive gentle giants with Dr. Alistair Dove. Now get ready for this. Dr. Dove is the Vice President of Science and Education. He is a broadly trained marine biologist, conservationist, and a leading authority on the biology of whale sharks. He has helped expand our research and conservation department into the multifaceted, globally respected program it is today. So we're going to discuss everything that we need to know and a couple things that we probably didn't know about these mysterious gentle giants. Al, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure, Josh. Thank you so much for having me here, especially for the first episode. It feels special. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Al, over the years, you know, you and I have, have worked together for several years now. You know, we've talked here and there. We've never got a chance to actually just sit down and talk um, about one of my favorite topics, which you know, and that's, and that's sharks. Sharks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm happy to do it. And I love talking about whale sharks. I can literally talk about whale sharks underwater. So let's do it. And I can't think of a better place for you and I to be sitting down and talking than right here next to the largest indoor aquarium in the entire Western Hemisphere. We're here at Ocean Voyager. It's fabulous. I forget sometimes that it's down the hall and I just need to get out of my office and come down here. And every time I do, it blows my mind. Yeah, it's it's one of those kind of moments that as that as an employee, you know, you, you kind of go through your day to day every now and then. But when you kind of need that little just moment of this is where I am, all you have to do is look into Ocean Voyager. And it's it's completely, you know, just kind of mind blowing how large it is and how amazing these animals are when you get to see them. It's a little distracting, too. So we'll be talking and then a whale shark will go by right behind us. And that's uh, it's it'll take your attention away for sure. Exactly. But. It's not really stepping on your lines. It's just kind of swinging by and, and seeing what we're up to. It's pretty cool that we're talking about them and we actually get to see them kind of right here behind us. Um, so we are celebrating International Whale Shark Day, uh, which is very important for us, considering that we are the only aquarium in the entire Western Hemisphere to showcase this iconic species. So I'll kind of kind of take us through... Um, and I know this is a very broad question, so just kind of take us through the, the research and, and conservation efforts that in the field and here at the aquarium that, that you've been a part of over the years. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great and huge question. Uh, but we've had the good fortune to have whale sharks here at the aquarium since, since we opened. And what an extraordinary opportunity to, to learn about one of the ocean's most mysterious animals. You would think, as the world's biggest fish, that we would know everything there is to know about it. But that's far from true. Uh, certainly when we opened, there were huge knowledge gaps with whale sharks. And so our team set about trying to fill some of those gaps. Um, many of those questions were things we were able to answer here at the aquarium uh, with the opportunity to really l follow individual animals over a long period of time and closely monitor their behavior, uh, study their health, study their growth, study their nutrition, all of those sorts of things. But then there was a whole other set of, of research questions that couldn't be answered here. And to, for that, we needed to go to the field and meet whale sharks where
where they are, which is pretty much anywhere in the tropics where the water is above about 71 degrees. You could, you could find a whale shark. Uh, but you'll have a tough time because they're not that common. Um, so what we really homed in on was is half a dozen places around the world where whale sharks gather seasonally in large numbers. And once we had reliable aggregations, we like to call them constellations of whale sharks, then you had the basis of a research program. Right. And we could start to plan to be there when they were going to be there uh, and to put tags on them, to get samples from them and to begin to get a look into the lives of a whale shark through their eyes. That's awesome. So I guess maybe we should take just a, with all that being said, maybe take just one, one small step back there and maybe I guess also talk about what is the whale shark. I mean, that's as broad of a question too, as I know the first one was, but uh, you know, it, these animals in the ecosystem, what, what roles do they play? What, what amazing whale shark facts that over the years you've accumulated? Just tell us more, I guess, uh, just about the animal in general. And we'll get to the aquarium stuff here in a little bit. Yeah, sure. And, and I have to start with like the most obvious one, which is this, the name is really confusing. Whale shark. Is it a whale? Is it a shark? It is a shark. It's not a whale. It's a fish. And you can tell that on the most basic level, if you look at their tail, the tail of sharks goes from side to side. The tail of whales goes up and down. Um, uh, but of course, there are many other differences, whales being warm blooded, sharks being uh, the same temperature as the water that's around them. So they are related to other sharks and fishes, although in many ways radically different from what we think of when we think about sharks. We usually imagine that sleek, toothy predator, maybe a great white, something like that. Yeah. That is not what whale sharks are about. They are one of only three sharks that are filter feeders. That means they like to, uh, to eat plankton. And so they don't have big teeth. They do have teeth. They're really, really small and there are thousands of them, um, but they don't use them for, for munching down on, on big fishes. They, they're largely non-functional. Mostly they use these filter pads that they have in their throat to separate plankton from water. And that's how they make a living. I honestly, that's the first time I've ever, I had no idea that whale sharks actually had teeth. Yeah, about 3,000 teeth, I think. They're, you can see them on, on the bottom jaw. They feel like the hook half of Velcro, if that makes sense. If you've ever pulled a, a piece of Velcro apart, it's got the fuzzy side and the, the hook side. Well, that's what the teeth feel, kind of like the hook side. Um, they don't seem to have much function. They're just sort of an evolutionary hangover. Um, and they follow, uh, really, all of the feeding happens in their throat instead. Right. So, and, and speaking of, of feeding, you might have, you might have actually just said this, uh, and I apologize if you did, but their throat is actually, for, for being such a large animal, they consume some of the smallest animals in the ocean, um, but is that, is that, and their, their throat is very, very small. Now, as they're filter feeding, are they just swimming around? Do they, is there any type of, of funneling or suction or kind of take us through like when a whale shark eats? Is what it, happens? Is it lazy? Is it, there's actually a little bit more of a dynamic process in there? What do you kind of kind of take us through that. Yeah, sure. So it starts with their anatomy, which is kind of crazy. The, their mouth is enormous. Even the mouth that we see for up to four feet wide at the front, maybe even larger than that. But perhaps more than its width is how far back it goes. The mouth extends almost all the way back to the pectoral fins on the side of the body. Right. Um, so the mouth is this giant sort of capacious space inside their head. Um, and that, that's huge. But when you get to the back of it is this tiny throat that's roughly the size of a quarter. So that huge mouth is all for separating the plankton from the water. But when they've garnered enough of the stuff and they're ready to swallow it, it actually passes down a fairly small pipe to get to their stomach. So that's, that's the, the start of it all, this crazy anatomy that they have. Right. But when they're out there in the field, they're actually pretty clever. They've got several different ways of feeding. You might think just open that big old mouth wide and swim forwards. And that is certainly one way that they can feed. But the most common way we see them feeding is at the surface. They'll get their top jaw just out of the water and they'll pump their bottom jaw uh, open and closed. And that causes little waterfalls of, of, of the very surface of layer of the water to cascade into their mouth. And that allows them to harvest all of the tiny plankton that are floating right on the surface. So they are exquisitely adapted for feeding on the surface. There's another mode too, when they find a really dense patch of food, like a, a ball of small bait fish or krill or something, they'll park themselves and, and their body actually goes completely vertical. And we, we call it vertical feeding and they'll mm. just hang there, pumping their mouth and sucking in huge amounts of water. It's much more efficient for them uh, to just stop at that moment. If they found a, a good spot to feed, mm. they'll stop and hang vertical in the water column. So they can adapt their filter feeding methods on the fly, depending on what sort of food is available. 
It's now time for a quick break as we jump, or should I say dive, into everyone's favorite segment, Fin Files, with Carly and Kelsey. What fascinating facts do we have today, ladies? So Josh, today, I know you guys are talking about whale sharks. Um, recently, I was reading about whale shark brains, as we do around here, you know. Um, and I saw that whale sharks actually have larger cerebellums than a lot of other shark species, even though their brains are quite small. So cerebellums are actually linked to motor function. And they think for whale sharks, it has to do with the fact that they swim vertically to feed because that takes a lot of like enhanced motor function to do something like that. Being how large they are and just getting their body that way in the water column. Isn't that kind of crazy? No, that's a great fact. I, I think that's really, really cool. Um, what, uh, as, a, as other sharks go, do they have a bigger, smaller brain than other sharks? So their brain is actually a little bit smaller than other sharks, even though that cerebellum part is larger. So it's kind of crazy. Relative to size, they have kind of a small brain. Cerebellum's big, so they can get their large body just around the water. That is very, very cool. All right. That's a great fun fact. Thank you guys very much. Thank you both for joining us, and stay tuned for the next Fin Files. In no way, shape, or form am I a shark expert. I would call myself a shark enthusiast. And I actually just kind of thought of this question. I've never actually thought of it before as we're talking about whale sharks and feeding. You know, the, the more toothy sharks, they have that sense of smell. The whole, uh, they can smell a drop, drop of blood in, in a vast you know, portion of water, and they're attracted to vibrations, things like that. These whale sharks, which your research and, and other uh, scientific research has shown, you know, these animals are migrating, they're traveling great distances. How do they know where these tiny you know, their food isn't necessarily what you think of when it comes to sharks. It's very, very small. They're filter feeders. Do they have a sense of smell? How do they locate or know where these huge aggregations of of their food is going to be? Uh, that's a great question. And the truth is, we don't have all the answers for that one just yet. They do have very large nostrils, or in, in sharks, we call them nares. Um, they have nares. Uh, they're very large and set very far apart on their head, um, but they're enormous. And a big part of their brain is given over to the, the, the uh, processing of smell information that comes from those nares. So mm -hmm. they're living in an olfactory world. They're living in a, a world of smells, like your average dog lives in a world of smells and sounds. Much the same for a whale shark. They live in a world of smells, and we think they probably use that, that sense of smell to home in on where the food mm -hmm. is. Um, what are they smelling then? If, if the toothy sharks are smelling blood from injured animals, what does a whale shark smell? Well, there are some th chemicals that are given off by plankton mm -hmm. uh, in the water. Some of them stay in the water. Some of them are volatile, and they go up into the air that lies over the water. And we think perhaps as they swim along with that top jaw out of the water, they can actually smell the air layer just above the water, and they can smell uh, rich plankton patches uh, by some of the chemicals that they give off. It's mm. confusing to us because we can't smell anything when we're out there except ocean. Mm. But maybe to them it smells like, you know, uh, chocolate chip cookies warming on a window shelf or something like that. And they And they, they, okay, I've homed in on that. And then they begin a swimming pattern that helps drive them towards the source of that smell. So it's very interesting because when, when people talk about sharks, there's always you know, that kind of that, that mindless misconception, you know, that, that word mindless killer, mindless eating machine, um, which you and I both know is, is not accurate. And it's amazing to me because whale sharks seem so, you know, kind of docile, docile, peaceful. They're just kind of swimming, doing their thing. But it seems like there's a lot more going on than, you know, than what we you know, more than meets the eye with these guys. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, one of the ways that we key in on that is by watching them closely and, and having the opportunity to do that here at the aquarium has really launched that science forward. And the other thing that you need to do with whale sharks is slow down. I mean, we're all so used to looking at, uh, at mammals who live at warm-blooded speeds, which are much faster. To understand a whale shark's behavior, you, you can't watch them for five minutes or 10 minutes. You have to watch them for hours, days, or even years, which, is, which we've been doing, mm -hmm. to really start to peel back the onion and start to, to get to the, the, the meat of what is, their, what is their behavior coming from. But they're certainly much more sophisticated about finding food than we thought. And uh, they seem to be capable of adapting their feeding method depending on what the situation demands, whether they're at the surface or at depth, whether they're feeding on fish or plankton or fish eggs, they'll change on the fly. Uh, I don't know how conscious they are about that, but they're certainly capable of very sophisticated foraging behaviors. Nice. So, um, you know, c kind of compared to 
our animals here in Ocean Voyager, um, you know, they have a very, uh, very strict diet. Their nutrition is very closely watched and monitored by our experts here. When, when you're out in the field kind of studying these guys, are you, are you seeing them feed all the time? Is it a morning? Is it an evening? Is it all day long? They're, they're, they're kind of foraging and, and following the plankton or is there, is there any type of pattern? That you've noticed here yeah i'll give you the most frustrating of answers which is it depends it depends sure. on where we are and it depends on what they're feeding on uh, but uh, in mexico for example where we studied whale sharks for many years they were feeding on tuna eggs and the tuna was spawning in the in the early hours of the morning the eggs would float to the surface and so as soon as the sun came up so did the whale sharks and they would spend their mornings gorging on fish eggs um, actually for about four months it was it was really quite an extraordinary event but in other places that you go to, uh, whale sharks don't seem to feed that way. There are places where they feed on uh, cl crab larvae and, and little tiny zooplankton, and, and that's a, a very different strategy, and you see them at doing things at different times of day. In Tanzania, for example, where they're very common in a place called Mafia Island, the whale sharks there spend a lot of time eating fish. Uh, and so they, they look for big bait balls and then they hang in the middle of those bait balls. Actually, the bait fish like to cluster around their head. They think they're getting some protection from tuna and other predators, but it's, it's, uh, it's a ruse because the whale shark just has to open their mouth and end up eating half of the bait ball all at once. So uh, yeah, we see them feeding in different ways. They probably do a lot more um, uh, feast and famine in the nature than they do in the aquarium where they tend to get three square meals a day. Mm -hmm. um, but out there in the ocean, they probably find really productive spots, feed really hard for a while, and then they have to swim across a large expanse of largely empty ocean to find the next hot spot. Um, so I think about it as going from all-you-can-eat buffet to all-you-can-eat buffet by running a marathon in between. Well, everything except for running a marathon is something I'm very used yeah, to they can uh, going <laughs> from <laughs> all-you-can-eat buffet to all-you-can-eat buffet. I mean, I, I, I don't blame them at all. So, all right, so these guys, they're, they're, they're going all over in the ocean. I mean, the ocean is, we know, the ocean is huge. So with them being so widespread and traveling from, from one place to another, what type of ecological role do, do whale sharks play? Or is, that, might be another, that might be another question that is a little, you know, a little difficult to answer at this point, which is why we're studying them. But uh, yeah, from, from your experience, what, what kind of niche do, do, do whale sharks you know, kind of fill there in the ocean ecosystems? There's a couple of things I would say about that. One, one is that they have, we think, maybe one of the largest habitats of any species on the planet. Um, they are uh, the deepest diving fish that we know of, so they can dive down at least a mile, um, and they can, they can occur from coast to coast across the open ocean anywhere in the tropics. That is a truly vast expanse of this planet and a vast three-dimensional world because that, that you add, add in that depth component as well. They probably have more available habitat than just about any other animal, uh, which, is, which is pretty amazing in and of itself. But with regards to the niche that they fill, they've got a unique role because they, they do this thing that, that many plankton giant, plankton feeding giants do, which is that they're feeding really low on the food chain. So rather than that white shark that sits on top of the food chain and, and you have small fish getting eaten by ever bigger fish until you get to the white shark, um, whale sharks have decided to skip all that and go straight to the bottom uh, and feed on the plankton directly. Why would you do that? Well, because there's a lot more energy available, more food energy available on that level. Uh, we think it goes down by about 90% as you go up each level of the food chain. So if you want to find more food, go to the lowest levels. That's where it's waiting. So they've, they've got this role of, of feeding on the, the first layers of the trophic level. And they may have really important roles to play that we've just started to explore. All of that plankton mm -hmm. gets turned into a whole lot of plankton poo. Um, and when they drop that off in the ocean, it sinks to the bottom and it exports nutrients into the deeper layers of the ocean. And we're just starting to learn that big plankton feeding animals like whales and whale sharks and manta rays may play really important roles helping the climate, believe it or not, by fertilizing the deep layers of the ocean with nutrients that they harvest when they're feeding at the surface. Wow. Okay. I wasn't expecting that. That's really cool. Yeah. I come to learn about whale shark poo. What can yeah. I tell you? No, I mean, that's, that's why everyone's listening right now, Al, <laughs> is whale shark poo. Um, but that's, that's fascinating because, when, you know, again, when, when you look at them, they're just, 
you know, just almost like gigantic koi in a way. They're just kind of hanging out, just kind of swimming by, doing their thing. Yeah, can I can I say something about that? Because I, th- I think this business about how how peaceful they look mm-hmm. and how gentle and docile, it, that seems that way, and it even seems that way when you're, you're swimming uh, a little distance away. But when you get up next to them, they're actually moving along pretty quickly. And I can tell you from you know a scientist perspective of, of having a really limited amount of time to collect data or put tags on, uh, when you get up close to them, they look like they're not moving, but mm-hmm. they really are. They can book along. They, they usually swim about, uh, you know, uh, a body length every second or two. Um, and if your body length happens to be 30 or 40 feet long, that's moving pretty quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. So keeping up with them is actually it's kind of hard. So it's deceptive. It looks effortless. It looks like they're barely moving, but they are booking it along. Yeah, I've actually a couple of times myself as a as a volunteer diver here in Ocean Voyager, you know, you're kind of swimming along doing your thing, thinking that you're cruising, using your, your fins and in two tail strokes, they are zooming right past you Absolutely. and they actually leave a wake behind you. You yes, feel they the do. water current yeah, as they move. And and we'll, we'll frequently tell students who come with us into the field, if you are looking at the back of a whale shark, if you're looking at their tail, just stop because you are not going to catch them. Like once they've gone past you and you're looking at tail, it's too late. Um, the best thing to do is, is if you can, can be out in front of them so that as they, you can be on a converging course and as they come past you, you can do the science you need to do. That's awesome. But there's no point trying to chase them because they right. are much faster than they look. Well, with that speed in mind and, and trying not to chase them, you know, you're, you're talking about kind of their role in the ecosystem. Um, is there anything that that eats them where do they kind of go in that uh in that in that food web i mean i'm sure when they're very large it's going to be pretty tough but they're you know they do have to grow that's a great question so we think uh that their major predators are us unfortunately humans fishing for whale sharks is still a thing that happens around the world it's illegal in almost every part of the world but it does still happen so we are a a big threat to them but in terms of natural predators the only animal that's been documented taking down whale sharks and eating them is orcas the killer whale which occur not only in in the the cold waters but also throughout the tropics as well and they've been uh, observed one time fairly recently actually ganging up on a whale shark um, and harassing it literally to death Uh, and then they will um, pluck out the liver and and then uh, leave the rest so it's sort of a a Hannibal Lecter kind of thing eat the liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti and then they just leave the rest of the the whale shark's body behind that is we think the only species that can take down an adult whale shark I that's yeah as you know as sad as that is that is the circle of life obviously animals have to eat that must be quite an incredible sight uh, it well, two of the largest animals in the ocean uh you know going at it like that it must be Im- impressive i've never seen it in years of, of observing whale sharks um but it's certainly something that's going to happen for the for the most part though whale sharks take what we call the gape evasion strategy so the way they avoid being eaten by things is to literally outgrow the mouth of the thing that wants to eat you mm. right if, if if i can't fit you in my mouth i can't eat you so you know whale sharks put a lot of effort into growing really big really quickly early in life um, and they delay having babies until much later because they're putting all their energy into getting as big as they can as fast as possible and that mostly serves the purpose of uh, of helping them avoid predation by you know outgrowing the mouths of their predators sure and you were just talking about that growth rate is that uh, you know being able to have basically 24-hour observation on our whale sharks here have we been able to kind of identify that that growth rate ourselves or is the growth rate even known because like you said they're they need to get big quick and once they're big they're they're doing okay but is yes. there any any data on that just yet yes there is actually and we've we've provided quite a bit of data from the aquarium's perspective on how animals grow in the aquarium setting and by combining it with information from from field observations as well we just had a publication come out last year actually with the, some folks from the Australian Institute of Marine Science where we looked at growth rates in whale sharks and we established for the first time that males and females have different growth paths <laughs> males seem to flatten off around nine meters about 27 to 30 feet in length females keep on growing until they're 40 45 feet long that's the size of one of those big yellow school buses um, and they appear not to have a, a an asymptote they don't flatten off they, they just keep on growing mm-hmm. um, the, the largest one ever recorded was over 60 feet in length so there is a there appears to be we've just discovered this big difference between the way males grow and the way females grow 
That's very, very cool. And I guess it's got to be exciting you know, for you. Um, and I, people have been studying whale sharks, obviously, for, for a long time. Um, you've been doing it for how many years total now? About 50, I've been at the aquarium for 17 years. So for about 15 of those years, I've been actively studying whale sharks. And in that time frame, what would you say has been probably the most like the, the thing that stands out to you that, it, say, on Al Dove's first day at Georgia Aquarium, back in 17 years ago to right now what's been one or two of those little anecdotes where you're like we wouldn't have known that without this type of research being possible like what's been those those little cool moments of your studies that you're just like this is it this is yeah awesome. i can definitely point to a couple of those actually one of them happened quite close to when i started mm. uh, we needed to do a veterinary exam on one of the whale sharks and um, that meant um, anesthetizing a whale shark which had never been done before um, and so i was uh, charged with working with some of our life support staff on um, inventing a machine that could anesthetize a whale shark um, it was crazy we had a, we had a 2000 gallon carboy full of anesthetic laden water that we were able to use to control the anesthesia just the same as an anesthesiologist would at a vet clinic or in a, in a human hospital mm. uh, and we were able to put the whale shark under do the veterinary exam that needed to happen wake it up and let it go and i remember thinking at the time this is crazy we just invented an <laughs> anesthesia machine for the world's biggest fish that was a hoot um, flashing forward a few years i think uh, discovering uh, and helping to describe the biggest whale shark aggregation known to science that's the afuera aggregation in yucatan mm. mexico that was a real buzz. Um, sequencing the whale shark's genome was the first shark to have its genome completely sequenced. We did that with collaborators from Emory University. That was a big buzz. Um, and, uh, and more recently, um, going a little further afield on some expeditionary uh, research in search of the rest of the whale shark's life cycle, especially the reproductive parts, and, and helping to uncover St. Helena, this island in the South Atlantic, as perhaps the only place we know of in the world where whale sharks um, have been recorded um, mating and so that's a really special observation because we can't work out how to protect this species unless we understand those special places where really important parts of their life cycle are taking place sure now you just I'm, that was an awesome segue because I was we were about to make a trip to st. Helena right now so I've seen nothing but video of our field expeditions to uh, to st. Helena can you just describe to to our listeners just describe this place. Uh, it, it is one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been. So for biologists, the Galapagos is always sort of held up as the, you know, that's the Mecca, right? You have to go to Galapagos if you're a biologist. Um, I would add um, St. Helena as the sort of the Galapagos of the Atlantic. Um, it is physically spectacular. It's one island, it's not an archipelago. There's just one island that juts out right in the middle of the South Atlantic, halfway between Angola and Brazil. It's smack in the middle of the South Atlantic. Tiny, tiny rock. It's it's a volcanic island. There's almost no beaches on the island, so it's it's surrounded by giant rocky cliffs. Many of those cliffs have guns on the top from the time when Napoleon was exiled to that island at, at the beginning of the, the 19th century. He died there in, 18, in 1821, I think. Um, and he's, you can still visit his former grave, which is a bit weird. And he has a former grave on the island. Um, and then in the water around the island is this incredibly crystal clear, open oceanic water that whale sharks like to gather at looking for love apparently. Um, and it's just a really, really special place. And many of the fish that are there are also found nowhere else in the world. Uh, and even on the interior of the island, you find plants and animals that are not found anywhere else. And that makes it a really, really special place to visit. That's awesome. I'm sure quite a few people right now are probably Googling St. Helena right now, just to kind of, cause uh, honestly, before I started working here and, and kind of realizing what you guys were doing, I'd never heard of it before. And then when I actually saw where it was located, I'm like, no one knows, you, you just don't hear about it. It doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make the news that that often. Um, but it's really cool that, that we kind of have, have been able to, to utilize it to, to continue those studies. So when, when you're taking a trip to St. Helena, is it Atlanta to Brazil and then to the middle of the, how do you get it? Like this, it just seems like one of those King Kong esque type of expeditions, especially when you see what this island looks like. So when you're traveling, what is a trip to St. Helena like? What are you prepping for? What are you doing and, and how do you get there? It really is an adventure, especially when we first started doing it. Our first expedition at the beginning of 2015, 
they didn't have an airport. So the only way to get there was to fly to South Africa um, and then to get on a ship for five days. It's the mail ship that carries the mail to and from St. Helena. There's only 4,000 people who live there. Um, they've been isolated from the rest of the world for 500 years. There have been people there for more than 500 years. It's always been a maritime stop, especially when people used to sail to the east from Western Europe. They would always stop in St. Helena to take on water. Um, and so it, it probably had its heyday in the 1600s and 1700s, mm -hmm. which is a strange thing to say of a place. The population now is less than it was then. Um, and so to get there, we would take these, sh these five day ships uh, and it really was a, gr a great adventure. Now there's an airport there so you can actually fly. But even flying there is an adventure because it's uh, the airport runway is on the windward side of the island and it starts in a cliff and it ends in a cliff. So landing there is kind of hairy um, and it can be an adventure just getting to the island. And once you get there, you get a real sense of, you know, I really had to work to get to this place. Mm -hmm. It's not like you just, you know, uh, jumped in the car and drove down to the beach for the weekend. It's it really is a tremendous effort to get there. And even in this globally connected sort of era in the in the early 21st century, there are still places that are incredibly remote, mm -hmm. and it's not trivial because things like healthcare are very hard to come by on the island. If you have an emergency that can't be dealt with by the local doctor, you're looking at a, a five day ship ride to get back to the coast, and that's uh, that could be the difference between life and death sometimes. That's crazy. So it's it's definitely uh, the the flight in is definitely a seat back, tray tables up type of scenario. Uh, yeah, you you do do the white knuckles on the hand yeah. that you know the hand holds somewhat. That just that that sounds amazing, and all of that to study a whale shark. I love it. I mean that that is that 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 is an adventure that has got to be one of the 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 coolest aspects of your job that I can think of. I mean you're the one living that life, um, but from an outsider's perspective, that just seems. That just seems so cool. It really is. And I, I love the fact that uh, when we encounter them, wherever they are, we go and meet them where they are. Um, you might be in St. Helena, which is a, an English overseas territory. So English speaking people in the South Atlantic, or you might be in Chandrawasi Bay in Indonesia, surrounded by Indo-Malayan people or West Papuan people who speak a totally different language um, and, and have a completely different culture. So um, visiting whale sharks in different parts of the world has allowed the research team here and me personally to explore parts of the world that I never thought I'd get to see and so you know just just riding along with them a little bit through their life history has been an amazing adventure. Oh, that sounds incredible and from from your travels from going from places like St. Helena to to Indonesia to Mexico to then take us right back here to Atlanta do you see a different uh, you know is is there a sense of a sense of pride like from the locals when it comes to whale sharks I think one of my favorite things here is when you know native Atlanteans are like we got the whale shark you know there's that sense of pride that Atlanta has the whale sharks here you know it is it, in your travels have you noticed that like do, do people of St. Helena realize just how special that their area is do the people in Indonesia notice just how how special their area is when it comes to these incredible animals? I think that's a really insightful question. And, and yes, I mean, in St. Helena in particular, we worked to help them realize how special this was. They didn't realize, they knew that whale sharks had been seen mating there. They call them bone sharks in St. Helena, but it's, it's the same species. But they they didn't realize that, that seeing them mate was unusual until we told them that seeing whale sharks had, mate, had never been done anywhere else in the world. And so in the time that we've spent there, the six expeditions that we've done over the last um, 10 years there, has a lot of time been spent in, in uh, engaging the local community, helping them understand uh, the significance of, of the natural resources that they have. And it's great to see that enthusiasm grow locally. They've started a Marine Awareness Week. They started a whale shark a festival now they have in St. Helena. So you can go there and there's a, there's a parade through the streets with people with in, giant inflatable whale sharks and people wearing you know whale shark costumes and things. It's, it's a hoot to see that stuff happen. Uh, but it's not that way everywhere. I remember in, in Indonesia, uh, uh, there were some people that, that lived nearby where the whale sharks were gathering there who were scared of them. In the culture that they have, uh, whale sharks uh, represent uh, the ghosts of some of their ancestors and so there was some fear attached to them because uh, it, having a whale shark show up is essentially a, a kind of haunting experience for oh. them um, and so you get different cultural values attached to whale sharks depending on where you are in the world and that's another part of that sort of rich tapestry of what makes this species so interesting. So what about what about here in the time that you've been in Atlanta, you know, with, 
in your close proximity here to, to Ocean Voyager and the amazing whale sharks that we care for. Have you noticed, uh, you know, have you noticed people, like I mentioned, kind of taking that almost that kind of prideful ownership in a way? Have you noticed any per- perception changes when it comes to these guys? I have. I like to think that we've had a significant impact on, on the way society views this species. We've had more than 25 million people have a chance to build a relationship now with the world's biggest fish. That can't help but have some impact on the way people think about them. So uh, I, I think it's fantastic that, that we've got whale sharks in the middle of downtown Atlanta. I like to remind myself from time to time, if I'm having a tough day in the office and you know things are getting me down, maybe I don't want to look at my email inbox that day, I'll just grab a cup of coffee, go down the hall and realize that the world's biggest fish is swimming around in the middle of downtown Atlanta. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very awe-inspiring. And I, several um, uh, other other employees here at the aquarium have, have actually mentioned that too, that every now and then you just walk by Ocean Voyager and you're like, wow. You yeah. know, they're, they're swimming right next to you. Like, that, that is a massive animal. It's just, it's awe inspiring and it's, it really is just inspiring, especially to know that, you know, that we might not always have these guys around. Let's take a break and get a little behind the seas here as we look into some of the unique jobs that exist at Georgia Aquarium. And one of those really unique jobs has got to be the job that belongs to the gentleman right next to me, my good friend, Mr. Taurus Baker, who is our logistics coordinator. Taurus, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Josh. All right. So, buddy, I've known you for a long time. Yep. You and I work together on a weekly day, uh, weekly basis, Absolutely. sometimes daily Absolutely, basis. Absolutely, Josh. Um, so even with that being said, can you tell me just a little bit more about what it is that you do on a day-to-day basis and, and what goes into being a logistics coordinator? Absolutely, Josh. Well, here at the Georgia Aquarium, my job is pretty complex. I have the responsibility of receiving packages for all 30 plus departments here at the Georgia Aquarium, including our third party vendors. Um, my job consists of shipping and receiving conflict resolution. So sometimes there may be an issue with uh, with shipping. So I have to dive into that, make sure that's okay. Um, getting those packages to the right departments, making sure that the vendors are, uh, all the packages are accurate. We have a purchasing order system here, which all our packages get ordered through. Mm-hmm. Once those packages come in, I have to do a quick quality check, make sure all those packages are intact. And then once I do that, get it to the right departments. Well, I'll tell you, um, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the things you just described, such as diving right in when something goes wrong, yes. has usually been me or my department. So I want to thank you personally <laughs> yeah. uh, for for everything that you've done. Because seriously, with without you here, all the cool exhibits and all the cool things that that I get to be a part of would not be possible. So thank you, Josh. Yeah, man, your thank your you. job is very very important, thank and you. everyone here relies upon relies upon you. Thank you. And I'm not going to lie, if we had to do a vote of who would be the mayor of Georgia Aquarium, I'm pretty sure we'd all vote for Mayor Taurus Baker. Uh, I greatly yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> that will be an honor here. So, all right. So uh, now that you've kind of told us a little bit about about uh, about what you do, when did you start working here? How did you get here? Well, I started nine years ago, mm-hmm. back in 2013. Uh, cool story it was back in 2011, I applied for the Georgia Aquarium. Uh, it didn't really go so well, but I was so eager to get in this building and be part of this family. I tried uh, again reapplying in 2012. I uh, got better luck that time. I started in the housekeeping department as well as I think you guys know. I uh, did a year in housekeeping. Once housekeeping uh, outsourced, I transferred over to security. Did six months in security, and once the logistics position opened, I applied for that, and that's been my home for the last nine years. That's awesome. Yep. And we as the aquarium definitely definitely benefit from that, man. You do a great job. Thank you, brother. So before we go, one more question. Yeah. And I, I know some of the answers to this because I know when I get a call from Taurus on my on my office line, I'm like, <laughs> okay, what of mine just showed up it's that I have to go? It's something cool. <laughs> so speaking of something cool, what do you think is like the, the, the coolest thing or, or things that you can think of that have just showed up that you're like, Wow. Well, I can tell you firsthand when you guys had implemented that shipwreck exhibit in the Ocean Voyager, that was cool. That was <laughs> cool. I was happy to be part of that and help kind of navigate that thing up to Ocean Voyager. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. Of course, we have live animals come in as well. I got to make sure those animals are uh, well equipped and they get where they need to go in a timely manner as well. So, yes, uh, from toys from the gift shop to live animals 
two project pieces I have to have my hands on here at the George Aquarium. Very cool. And it's not every day someone can say, you know, how was work today? Oh, it was cool. Uh, a yeah. shipwreck came a in. A shipwreck came in, right. You are definitely Mr. Personality, that's for sure. Thank you, brother. So when it, when it comes to whale shark conservation from your, from your time out in the field um, and, you know, f- from, from your experiences here, would you say that things are getting better or worse for them out there? Unfortunately, I'd have to say that it's getting worse. So during the time that we've had whale sharks here in aquarium um, setting, uh, they have gone from vulnerable to endangered on the IUCN red list. That's the sort of international gold standard of, of, of endangered status. Mm. And so whale sharks, unfortunately, have gone to the endangered step. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's plenty of reason for hope. We, we did an analysis a couple of years ago uh, that uh, was looking at the potential for recovery. And uh, the analysis concluded that they have uh, potential for complete recovery. So whale sharks could recover to their pre-industrial populations if we let them. Mm. That's not the case for lots of endangered species. For example, if their habitat was destroyed, for example, they don't have the potential to come back. Um, Whale sharks do because of that enormous open ocean habitat that they have. That's not going anywhere. The ocean is still the dominant geographic feature on this planet. Mm. and, And thankfully that makes up their habitat. So although they may be rare, the potential for them to come back to their pre-industrial populations is there. We just have to let them. Um, and that means easing up on the fishing pressures and the, and the other things that threaten them, like getting hit by ships or encountering plastic pollution, and then giving nature a chance to recover. Thankfully, it's pretty resilient. You just have to give them time. That's awesome. Now, would you say too that one of those things, especially, I, I would like our, our listeners to maybe, you know, uh, definitely get that feeling that 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 they can help as well. So, in in someone's daily life, wherever they may be listening to this particular podcast, is there any any advice or anything in particular that that you could say that anybody anywhere could help to 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 bring them back to that non endangered pre industrial level? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. One is build a relationship with this animal. Like mm-hmm. It's very hard sometimes for people to connect to a fish that lives in the open ocean. If you live in Nebraska and you think, well, how, you know, how, what's this fish got to do with my life? Well, it may be helping you in ways you don't even know. I alluded earlier to the impacts that they might have on helping to regulate the climate. Mm-hmm. Um, but sorts of things that people can do no matter where you live that would help. Cutting down on single-use plastics is a great one. The ocean, unfortunately, is downstream of everything. So even plastic that's discarded in landlocked cities like Atlanta eventually find their way down the 300 miles of Chattahoochee River to the Gulf of Mexico where whale sharks live. And so, you know, our trash, even dropped on land, can become a problem for open oceans dwelling animals. And that exquisite feeding mechanism that they have that's so good at ingesting plankton, unfortunately, is also really good at ingesting microplastics as well. So we have to be mindful about what we're doing uh, with our consumer lifestyle. And even though it seems disconnected, like how, how can what I do with plastic bags in Atlanta affect a whale shark in St. Helena? It can. The ocean is a giant single connected system. And, and once the you can get your feet wet in the Chattahoochee here in Atlanta and keep them wet until you get to St. Helena. That's, that's how the ocean works. Uh, and unfortunately, that means that our actions can affect them regardless of where we live. Sure. So keeping with the theme for today, which is we are celebrating International Whale Shark Day, um, what would you say to a young, inspired, you know, in, in, in inspired young student who, who wants to live the life of Dr. Al Dove? What, what's your best advice to the next generation of whale shark enthusiasts, whale shark scientists, anything you got? I think there's some folks out there that are probably very interested to hear how they can get into the amazing adventure that you're living uh, every single day. Uh, Two words, get wet. Uh, That's my first advice to anyone who's interested in this. There is no substitute for putting on a mask and snorkel and sticking your head underwater and experiencing the wonders of the ocean first hand. Lots of people haven't had that opportunity. And so this is all kind of abstract to them until that one day that they get to do that. Um, You can do that here at the aquarium. We have we have um, um, swim and dive programs in Ocean Voyager. You can experience a whale shark here or you can experience them in the ocean in any number of places around the world that will allow you to uh, to experience that sense of awe and wonder. It's almost impossible for me to explain it to you. But when you when you see a fish the size of a school bus come out of the blue gloom and glide by. It's, it's a gift 
they, they give you a gift of that encounter. It may be 30 seconds, it may be a couple of minutes, uh, but when they leave, you will be changed and you'll, you'll have a different sense of appreciation of what the ocean has and how precious it is and it needs to be preserved. So my first advice to anyone who's thinking about going down this path is to get wet, get a, get a mask and snorkel on and get out there. Um, and once you light that fire of passion for the ocean, I don't think it ever goes out. It certainly hasn't for me. Now, Al, if you're, if you're a guest and you want to experience these animals up close and personal and a trip to Indonesia or St. Helena or Mexico just kind of isn't in your, in your travel budget, what are some really cool ways that our guests can get up close and personal with the whale sharks here in Ocean Voyager? Yeah, there are, there are three great ways you can do it. You can just come here as a regular guest. Everyone who comes to Georgia Aquarium gets to experience whale sharks in person and create that relationship with the world's biggest fish. But if you want to go deeper, literally deeper than that, uh, we have immersion programs. Guests can swim in the Ocean Voyager exhibit with whale sharks or dive if you're a scuba diver, a certified scuba diver. And so you can, you can pick a level that works for you and come and experience whale sharks and it, it will blow your mind, I'm sure. That's amazing. So I'm a diver and you're a diver. And I think we can highly recommend to any of our listeners out there that if you're not scuba certified, and it, it's, definitely, it's definitely a recreational activity that's worth it. So Ocean Voyager here is, am I wrong? It's 6.4, 6.3? 6.3, 6.4 million gallons. It's a lot of water. It's whichever lot. way you slice it. It's synthetic seawater. So we, we make the seawater here on property with, a, with Atlanta city water, which is actually really good. Mm -hmm. um, and we make the seawater here. And the water that you see in Ocean Voyager behind us is the same water that's been in that exhibit since we opened. The technology that we have for recycling and treating and keeping that water in tip-top shape for the animals is quite remarkable. I'm sure that's a topic for a whole other podcast episode. Right. And I guess people out there listening too wouldn't really realize that one of probably the best dive spots here in the United States is in downtown Atlanta. Damn straight. Awesome. Al, you just said it all. Thank you so much. This was episode oh, one. Welcome, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I learned a lot. That was amazing. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. This was episode one of Life Below the Surface. I'll see you on our next episode, guys, where we're going to take a trip to the coast of California to learn about our flippered friends, the California sea lion. Al, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, have fun celebrating International Whale Shark Day, and we'll see you in the next episode. Life Below the Surface is presented by Carriage Kia in Woodstock. Carriage is the official car dealership of Georgia Aquarium and Georgia's leading Kia dealer. Service, community, and education are hallmarks of Carriage Kia in Woodstock. When it's time for you to lease or purchase your new vehicle, we hope you'll consider Carriage Kia in Woodstock. Check them out 24-7 at carriagekiawoodstock.com. If you're hearing this message, you've listened to the entire episode. And for that, we thank you. We hope you enjoyed this first episode of Life Below the Surface. If you did, please leave us a review and share this episode with your friends. Also, please tell us which topics you would like us to cover in future episodes. Send us a message in the comments or on any of Georgia Aquarium's social media channels. See you in the next episode.